Many thanks for your company here. Now, executive chairman of Jospon Group of Companies, Joseph Siawe Japong, has debunked claims that he's corrupt. According to him, all these allegations are baseless, describing himself as a genuine businessman. He revealed that for the past two years, he's received no money from government after his company dealt with the waste management problem at both the Kole Lagoon and Lavender Hill. He further noted that he's never bribed his way to the top. He finally charged journalists to have detailed analysis on what determines a corrupt act before reporting. I don't bribe my way. I don't give people money to do that. The dredging, the dredging. 2015, June 3rd, there was a disaster that killed 200 people a second. I chose on my own will, went to Sweden, bought an equipment of a dredger because I was partnering a company called Conti. And Conti was giving the work, having sovereign guarantee and everything, $565 million. Our, the, our the local content partner. The loan could not come on. Conti left. I could have chose to use the money to place into fixed deposit. I went and borrowed money from a bank and bought a dredger. And I've been dredging up to date. Could you, could you believe that? I've not been paid one CD. The Conti was paid $10 million. I have not been paid one city for two years. And as a result of that, you can go to meteorological uh, uh, department and ask. The rain that fell 2016 is very heavy. But because we had, and we are still, we have not packed our tools. That is the passion of Joseph Japan. I like to share, I believe that this country can be well if we all contribute our effort. I'm still working at the college without payment of a city. Is that the person who bribes his way to get businesses? Lavender here, 100 years, fecal matter was thrown into the sea. And Ghana was stuck as the dirtiest country in the world. There are success generations that have come, governments have come and gone. I went, borrowed money from Barclays Bank, Zenith Bank, and other banks, and constructed today. Go and see the place. I've changed the place, I've stopped the fecal matter. That is the problem solver. That is my passion. When I see challenges and problems, I want to solve it. I want to prove to that the Ghanaian is capable. Let's give Ghanaians the chance. Let's encourage them. They can do it. So that is me. Do I bring my way to do that? So when people have said, and you see, it is part of the Ghanaian culture. Jealousy, enviness. I believe that when you see someone is doing something, just get closer to the person. How did you do it? If people come to me, I'll teach them. I'll tell them. Another time I made a statement that if you are looking for money, the banks are easy to get. The banks are there to lend money. It's only money they lend and they feed themselves. District Chief Executive for Jirapa, Christine Bombanye Amadu, has revealed the livelihood empowerment uh, program, LEAP, is replete with unqualified beneficiaries. She said some healthy young men and women have their names on the list of the beneficiaries. She said they've commenced investigations on the issue and those found to be unqualified will be removed from the program. She made the revelation of the first ordinary meeting of the Drapa Assembly. Joy News' Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafiq Salam reports from Drapa. By law, metropolitan, municipal and district assemblies in the country are enjoined to hold at least three ordinary meetings to enable the assemblies take stock of activities of the preceding months and also their plans for programs for the upcoming months. It is based on the aforementioned that assembly members from Jiroba District Assembly held their first ordinary meeting. District Chief Executive for Jiroba, Christine Bombanya Amodu, stated that the district is relatively peaceful and residents are going about their daily activities without any fear. She, however, was quick to add that there were pockets of armed robbery cases that posed a threat to the security of the district. Last month, the district recorded three separate cases of armed robbery attacks. One person was shot dead by the police. Four other suspects were also arrested and are currently standing trial. On the issue of internal generated funds, Christine Bombanya said an amount of 168,965 Ghana cities, 40 pesos, representing 46.93%, was realized. The percentage is a slight improvement of the 2016 figure, which was pegged at 45.33%. 
Despite the fee chalk, they still encounter several challenges. Revenue collectors move in to pick the revenue, and some of them threatened. If they joke, they will get to their homes and they will not be able to come out again. Uh, sometimes also when they go out, they bring reports that uh, they don't sell anything and yet we are coming to them to pick revenue. And so they are not ready to part. So what I'm actually telling them is, uh, it's just about education. They should educate the taxpayer that monies that they pay, that is what we use for development projects in their various community. If this education goes on, I believe that the taxpayer will be ready to part with whatever tax they are supposed to pay. She also spoke about plans to do an auditing of beneficiaries of the livelihood empowerment program, LEAP. Because information reaching me says some young men and women are beneficiaries, but the LEAP program is not for young men and women. It is for the aged. And so if you are not an agent and you are benefiting, it means you are not the right beneficiary. We are going to drop them and pick those who are actually supposed to be benefited. Don't you think that we can have young men that who are not all that uh, strong and who are feeling weak? Yes, yeah, so uh, they, the committee will come out with that. If they go in and they see that there are other young men and women who are benefiting and they are weak, we may consider them. But if it is that they are people who are energetic and can work, then they are not supposed to benefit. We will drop them. Reporting for BN News, Rafik Salam, Jiraba. The managing director of GCB Bank, Raymond Soa, has assured customers of UT and Capital Banks to rest assured their deposits are safe. In his first press briefing after he took over the two commercial banks following the revocation of their licenses by the Bank of Ghana, Mr. Reso has been encouraging their new customers to have faith in their new bank, GCB Bank. If you would like you to go through your question again, if you can read really comment I would say, I want to know, uh, I want to know, this is the family, and then we come to the position with the capital bank on that, the particular action at that time, if I stay here. And then how long did the negotiation or the discussions uh, take? And then the, the second bit of the question is, we know the central bank is starting to know, in the process of meeting the minimum capital requirement, and they are concerned that that will lead to some banks not being able to meet the minimum Bank of Ghana press conference yesterday? Well, I mean, I believe that all these things were discussed. So you will um, understand my being unable to veer into the space of the Bank of Ghana. Thank you. Well, that happened earlier today. Let's get onto the phone lines and speak to uh, my colleague Ebenezer Sabuti, who actually uh, attended that press briefing. Hello, Ebenezer. Hello, Richard. What else has the uh, managing director of GCB Bank GCB been Bank saying Bank apart from assuring customers, customers that their deposits that their are safe? safe? Apart from assuring customers that their deposits are safe, uh, both uh, Capital Bank and GCB Bank customers, 
they also been speaking about the employment, uh, I mean, opportunities or, you know, the place of employees at both Capital Bank and BC Bank. And the question was asked to what would happen to some of the workers. He responded by saying that they are not going to employ everyone over there, either UC or Capital Bank, but what they will be doing is to conduct an audit. So they will be conducting a skills audit to determine who is employed off. As to whether they are going to, the people who play it off are going to go in this seven pack, he responded that it's too early for him to take this time, and therefore we should wait for some months or few months for which the bank will restructure itself and then come out with the answer. Mm. So mm -hmm. it's been a day of working and then careful to them. All right. And they're not telling staff that mm. not mm. all of them are going to be affected. All right, Ebenezer, did they in any way touch on what will happen to uh, uh, their banks or the banks of, or the banking halls of these two banks they've taken over in, in, a, in a community where they already have a GCB bank branch? What happens if they still have a capital bank branch and uh, a UT bank branch, which they've taken over now? What happens? Will there be a measure they'll still have all these existing banking halls? Exactly. He said they are going to operate concurrently. So if you have UT Bank at the community and Capital Bank at the community, they are all banks and therefore they will be the same services. They will also be the same, same services. It's just an indication that the bank has to fund it. All right. So all right. Going to fund it. I mean, they are not going to be affected by it. But all right. They are going to Right, thank you very much, Ebenezer Sabute. Uh, then now let's go live to MFR Dradosi, and uh, she is at the NEMA branch of the former YouTube bank. Now we know it's, take, it's taken over by uh, GCB Bank with the latest. Hello, MFA. Hi, MFA, can you hear me? Hello. What, what can you report now, MFA? Right, so I've been to the Capital Bank branch at Tesano and also been to UT Bank at NEMA. Now, one thing I realized at these two places is that they still have their logos intact. Um, entering some of the banking halls, I see a number of people. For instance, Capital Bank, they have about 15 to 20. And whilst in UT, they had about 20 to 25 people um, at the bank area. Now, speaking to some of the customers, they tell me that they are not scared that their money are going to be locked um, into the account. However, some of them that I spoke to um, made withdrawals. And they tell me that they just want to be sure that they withdraw some of their money that even if the bank takes all the money, um, they have been able to withdraw some. And so even though they are laying the fears that the bank should take their money away, some of them today came to do withdrawals. But I must say that the banks um, have been doing their normal transactions today. Mm. And uh, did you pick up any information from the workers there? How are they feeling? We haven't really heard from mm. them since I, this I happened. I tried to speak to some of the workers. Um, they didn't want to speak to me on record. But they are saying that they were okay and that transaction and everything was going on as normal. And that's uh, all they could tell me. Sure. Thank you very much, MFA Dradosi, with those updates. Away from uh, that, tutors of the Cape Coast Nursing Training College hail the introduction of the quota system adding. It's an opportunity for them to take trainee nurses through thorough practicals. Well, there's been a public uproar against government's introduction of a quota system in the various nursing training colleges. The move has been described by opposition political parties as a deceptive one by the government. Well, some nursing training tutors are rather hailing the decision. Tutors of the Cape Coast Nursing Training College this morning spent time cataloging to the health minister, Kwikwajima Mainu, how quality training has been compromised all this while because of the huge number of trainees they have to offer practical trainings to. Health Minister Kwekwajima Mainu says this has vindicated government. He tells Joy News government considered all these challenges before taking that tough decision. He says for now, their concentration is on training more midwives and community health nurses to help in the fight against maternal mortality. The challenges within the health sector are enormous, and I believe you are aware. From the human capital we are using to do our work, and seriously health issues are seriously labor intensive, with different types of skills and specialties and specializations. Then I'm encountering several groupings within the health sector workers, nurses and midwives and different groups 
and uh, pharmacists and different groups, several of them, and doctors and uh, not very many different groups, but several specialties that we have. So almost every week, we receive not less than about 15 groups. Allied Health alone has several of them, you know, and they are new. With all the working conditions, and we haven't got one, the pharmacist in public service, and then those with working conditions that we haven't fully completed implementing. And at the back of the heels of it, the debts that we came to inherit. This is Joy News Today with me, Benis Abubedu. Still to come on Joy News Agenda Today, we take you to the Upper East Regional Town of Bani on the fight against Galamsey. Thank you for staying here on Joy News today. It's a land of gold engulfed in controversy between some local miners and Chinese who are providing technical support to other local miners. When the controversy deepened following the death of seven local miners this year, fears grew that there could be a standoff and government had to intervene. Today on Joy News Agenda, which focuses on Galamsey, Upper East Regional Correspondent Albert Sorry chronicles events in the Talency District town of Bani, where locals in the area are constantly at loggerheads with a foreign mining company, Shangyi Mining. Bani, a large farming community rich in gold. Like all mining areas in Ghana, Bani has a mix of all manner of persons constantly prospecting for gold. There are the legal mining entities and, of course, the illegal miners, popularly known as Galamsey operators. The pollution of water bodies and the destruction of land surfaces, which typically characterize Galamsey operations, are missing here at Bani because the mining here is done underground. Over the years, Several deaths have been recorded among the local miners due to underground accidents. While these accidents are thought to be due to unauthorized blasts often carried out by the illegal miners themselves, the local people always put the blame on Shanji Mining, a Chinese mine support service company working in the area. Since 2013, many young men, including Sifas Bazin Woman, Nambok Yao, Tahiru Yusufu, Boazo, among others, had perished through deliberate blast poisoning. Shangzi Mining Ghana Limited practices bad mining against the standard regulation. They blast unannounced. They this was Charles Boazo, a youth leader at Bani, addressing a press conference in May this year few days after seven miners had been killed inside an underground pit near the concession where Shanji Mining operates. The Shanji Mining Company denied responsibility for the deaths of the miners, but government subsequently directed the company to suspend operations to allow investigations into the matter. However, that did not put an end to the controversies between the local miners and the Shanji Mining Company. Last week, some workers of the Shanji Mining Company told Joy News, while they were underground on routine checks, they were attacked by some illegal miners. So when we were there, the Galaxy boys entered inside. We shouted at them and we arrested three of them. So we asked one of, uh, the, one of our workers to take them out and come back because somewhere inside. So the Galancy boys, some ran out and have to organize their boys inside the gate. So before we realized, there were like 50 people inside. Mm, there were many. And that night, you can't count them, but there were many. And they have to beat us. When we saw them, then they, we were waiting for them to come so that we would talk to them. After they came up, 
Then one person came out, we were able to get him so that the security men took them up. Then from that one, because of the reaction of other people, the remaining one came and they started attacking. So that is why I have this. When Lands and Natural Resources Minister John Peter Mewu paid an official visit to Bani, operators of Shanji Mining explained that the activities of the Galamse operators were the cause of the numerous misunderstandings. These pits have been deepened, dangerously deepened, to our underground workings. And they use them as entry pits to the workings we have underground. God knows where these people get their explosives from. They drill and blast our support pillars, all in the purposes of stealing the ore underground. They convey with them weapons such as clubs, locally made pistols, hammers, chisels, whatever. Uh, the Lands and Natural Resources Minister toured various areas at Bani, where Minerals Commission officials revealed that some of the illegal miners have managed to dig some pits which are concealed in their homes. They often use these pits as access routes to go underground and carry out their mining activities without being detected. Uh, illegal miners are able to duck, you know, create their own shaft to assess the whole bodies of this mining facility. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's proper we take up the, uh, the matter. What the government keeps on saying day in, day out is the methodology that is adapted in the practices of the mining. That is, uh, I had discussions with the regional minister and he's going to take up the matter seriously. Uh, some of these small scale associations under our multilateral mining integration project, uh, they've been catered for in that. This house is said to be hiding one of such pits, but at the time of the minister's visit, the owner was not around. No illegal miner would speak on record for fear of getting arrested. However, most of them insist that Galamse is a means of livelihood for them and government has to take a second look at its stance on Galamse. For Joy News, Albert Sori, reporting from Bani. Away from the fight against illegal mining, head of payment systems at the Bank of Ghana sector, Amediku, says Ghana's mobile money penetration is not bad, contrary to some views that the country uh, is trailing behind, uh, like, like, is trailing behind other countries like Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya. He was speaking at the third Joy Technology and Innovation Summit in Accra. Maxwell Agbaba joins me now with more. Hello, Maxwell. Hello, hello, Maxwell. Ben. Yes. Yeah, hello, Ben. Uh, apart from uh, debunking uh, the notion that Ghana is trailing behind in terms of mobile money uh, transactions, uh, what else has been happening at that particular fair, Jotis? Well, um, Ben, the summit has um, brought together top players in the mobile money industry here. A um, lot of the discussion has centered on how we can leverage um, the main the technology of mobile phones you know, provide um, to move our economy from a cash dominant one to a cash um, economy. Now, we've had the managing director and co-founder of DPA Mobile Financial Services um, Limited. He has been um, enumerating some of the many opportunities manifesting out of the mobile technology of um, financial services. In fact, he mentioned some of them as unrestricted market access and then remittance inflows and then um, instant payments as some of the many benefits that we are getting um, from the mobile uh, money platform. But he admits, however, that um, there have been um, some challenges like data protection and fraud management, and also um, the need for standardization and how to manage liability shifts. An uh, example has to do with how sometimes when you, uh, when you do a transaction, sometimes it goes to the wrong recipient, but it's difficult getting back, you know, um, those money. Now, during the discussion and um, session, uh, you know, one of the members of the panel, Dr. Um, Seth Amediku, who is the head of management systems, who is the head of payment systems, as you say, at the Bank of Ghana, downplayed suggestions that um, Ghana is, you know, lagging behind in terms of the mobile money um, revolution. He said current figures of the cent at the central bank, you know, indicates that about 21 million Ghan Ghanaians have active mobile money accounts and latest transaction figures actually amounts to about 1.8 billion cities. He says government has given mobile money a major boost uh, by using, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, the LEAP platform and um, also paying public sector workers using 
um, the mobile money, you know, platform. The general manager for mobile services at MTN, um, Eli Haney, has also been responding to a question on the propriety of taxing monies in a mobile wallet. He says that would derail the huge gains made by the industry. Therefore, he's saying that it wouldn't be proper, uh, it wouldn't be advisable for, you know, industry players to start taxing uh, mobile money. Dennis. Joy Technology and Innovation Summit held here in Accra. <music>